Hello everybody, welcome to the first video of the semester. In this particular video, we're going to talk about two concepts that you have already learned in your theory class, but we're going to go a little deeper into them and we're going to see how they can help us in the study of form. The two concepts are phrase and cadence. And uh, here we go. We started this class by talking about the elements of sound and the elements of music and how they prompt our perception of distinct segments of music. This happens because that is the way that the brain perceives reality. That's the way that the, the brain organizes the constant stream of information it, that it gets into manageable chunks, into meaningful chunks. Pretty much we segment reality in order to better understand it and better perceive it and better make sense of it. So talking a little more about music specifically, we have to mention that the formal organization of music is hierarchical. What does that mean? That a small segment will group with another small segment to form a larger segment of music. And that larger segment may in turn group with another larger segment. And this goes on and on, so it creates different levels. That is why when we were using timeline, for example, we can do things like that. We can say that there's a segment here, and we can say that there's another segment here, and probably these two segments group together and then there's another segment here and another segment here and those two group together as well and we can go even further and group these two together and maybe this second part of the of the piece groups similarly and we could group it all into the whole form of the of the composition or, or into the form of the whole composition it would be better said if we go back to Kendrick's example, that's exactly what we see. For example, if we take a look into this section, we can see that there's a segment of music here, there's another segment, and those two group together to create the first verse, and that groups with the second verse and create the whole section called the verses. And after that, we have other sections that also group together and create a different section that we're going to call the chorus, right? So understanding this is great and all, but there is one issue that comes with it. What are we gonna consider the smallest subdivision that, that we are gonna call a substantial chunk, a meaningful chunk? And that's where the concept of phrase comes in. A phrase is a concept that has been discussed a lot by music theories and there isn't one single definition that everybody agrees on. But for this class, we can say that a phrase is a segment of music that expresses a complete musical thought or a complete musical idea. In order to do this, we usually perceive a distinct beginning, middle and end. That is our first definition of a phrase. And maybe you can see that this can be very subjective. What if somebody thinks that a segment of music is complete or, or is a complete idea and somebody else doesn't? And somebody hears something as an ending and somebody else doesn't, right? So in order to further define this concept, let's add an addendum to it. When we're talking about tonal music, we can consider that a phrase is a segment of music that completes directed motion towards a cadence. And there comes our second concept, cadence. But before that, let me show you in my book, what is a good example of a phrase? This is Radiohead's High and Dry. You can see that it has a clear beginning, middle and end, and that it completes motion towards a cadence, that in this case is, is a plagal cadence. When we have a phrase, we usually, or for this class, we're gonna put an arc on top of it, just, just to show that it is a phrase in an hour analysis. Let's listen to this. Two jumps in a week, but you think that's pretty clever, don't you, boy? We talked about how the elements of music help us perceive or, or prompt us to perceive this segmentation, right? We can see, for example, that this section is very similar to this one, so there's a repetition there. Uh, so maybe that helps us perceive it as beginning and middle, and we can see that there's some silence, so there's duration of silence at the end of this phrase, which also helps us to perceive that there's a boundary there, something finished there. If we talked about pitch, for example, we can see that the last note is the lowest of the whole phrase, which may also help us determine that something finished there. Let's talk about harmony, for example. This E major chord is the tonic of this song, so the fact that it reaches tonic at that point where it also has the lowest note 
and it's also put on bit one of the measure, it also helps us to establish that sense of completion. The second concept that we're going to talk about, I mentioned it in this video, is cadence, which is something that you also studied in, in your theory sequence, but it'll be good to go a little further into it. What is a cadence? One, one definition that I like, <laughs> it's not the most precise of all, but one that I really like, was given by Heinrich Christoph Koch, who was a German theorist contemporary of Mozart and Haydn. He said that cadences are resting points of the spirit that only feeling can determine, which I love it. It's a very poetic definition of it. If you want to go a little further, we can say that a cadence is like a punctuation mark at the end of a segment of music that we're going to call a phrase that creates a sense of resolution, of completion, of rest, of repose, right? So let me play for you a couple of examples of this. This is William Boyce's Symphony Number no. 1 in B-flat major. This is Can't Hell Falling in Love by Elvis. Falling in love with you. Let's round it up with one more. This is the ending of the first phrase of the Nocturne number two in E flat, opus nine number two by Chopin. The term cadence actually comes from the Latin cado, which means to fall down, and it refers to the natural intonation of the voice going down at the end of a at the end of a phrase. We naturally signal the end of a phrase when we're speaking by changing our intonation, and generally it's a falling down intonation at the end of a phrase. Like I just did, hopefully. So I've mentioned, and I will keep mentioning throughout the semester, that language and music have a lot of similarities. And maybe we can explain the concept of cadence by referring into language. So let me do an experiment. I've, English is not my first language, so it's a little hard sometimes, but let's try it and see how it goes. What happens if I start talking like this because I want to tell you something, but I don't take any breaks in the middle and I just keep going, I'm going, I'm going, and what you hear is a constant stream of information and you don't know where it begins and where it ends and you start getting confused and you don't know anything and I can't breathe, right? That's not the way we talk. When we talk, we use changes in intonation, in volume, in, in rhythm, in tone, and those changes in the pattern of our speech usually signal to the listening a lot of things. How is it that I'm organizing what I'm trying to tell you? Does it make sense? What is my attitude towards what I'm trying to say? Is it ironic? Am I, am I being truthful? Am I telling a lie? And something very important, for example, with intonation, we can tell if I'm asking a question or if I'm saying a statement. I can say, hey guys, see you all on Tuesday? Or I can say, hey guys, see you all on Tuesday. So just by changing my intonation, I was able to either close what I was trying to say, I'll see you guys on Thursday, or leave it super open, I'll see you guys on Thursday. So just like in a speech, the interaction of intonation and volume and tone and rhythm can convey things to the listener. In music, it is the combination or the interaction between melody, harmony and rhythm what can convey a sense of closure to the listeners. I almost forgot about this. Closure is going to be such an important word for us in this class that I put an extra animation of it. Okay, we're done. We can keep going. Why does this happen? And the key word is expectations. In a speech, for example, since we were little kids, we've been implicitly trained to hear that when somebody finish a sentence with an intonation going up, they usually want to ask for information. It's a question for us. When they finish with the intonation going down, we have learned to recognize that there is a statement or, or, or an affirmation that has some closure at the end of it. So it is exactly the same with music. By being exposed to music, and especially to tonal music since we were little kids, we've been trained to recognize the specific ways in which composers use the elements of music to indicate closure. Specific combinations of melody and bass line with 
the harmony that they implied and the specific placement, the specific rhythmic placement of those things in a piece of music. We hear those specific combinations, our brain recognizes that pattern and that schema, and it says, oh, something is coming, something is coming to an end. The brain creates expectations of what is coming next. Remember that I told you that the brain interacts or makes sense of reality by segmenting it into meaningful chunks? Well, phrases are those meaningful chunks, we could say. So an example of a combination of all these that we've learned to recognize as closure is this. When we hear that, we usually associate it with a moment of closure. So if I add harmony to that, it would sound something like this. And hopefully by now, your brain is going like, oh my God, I recognize that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Something is happening there. And if I don't play it, there's a lot of tension in you because you have a lot of expectations that haven't been properly resolved. So if I finally do this, all your expectations have been taken care of. And that is exactly what provides that feeling of repose, of rest, of finality to it, is the cessation of expectations. So at this point, we can have the actual definition of cadence. A cadence is the completion of a melodic and harmonic progression that serves to articulate the end of a phrase. This is the progression that I just played. So when the last two chords are dominant to tonic or five to one, which is tension to relaxation, tension to repose, instability to stability, which is the backbone of the, ton of the of tonal music in general. We call this an authentic cadence. This is like the one. When on top of this, what we hear follows certain expectations that we associate with closure, being that both final chords are in root position and that the melody ends on a scale degree one, we don't only call this an authentic cadence, we call it a perfect authentic cadence. This is the cadence, this is the one, this is the real deal, this is the archetypal combination of all these things that produces the maximum amount of closure when we hear them. So let's take a moment here to define some terms that we can use in order to further describe the, the, these moments of cadential closure. The last chord, when our expectations get resolved, we're gonna call the point of cadence. And usually when we're analyzing music, we put a fermata on top of it just to show that that is the point of cadence and that a cadence is taking place there. The progression of chords leading into a point of cadence that also includes it, by the way, is what we're gonna call the cadential progression. Let me say that again. The cadential progression includes the point of cadence. So let's go a step further. If we analyze this chord progression, we can see that it has a tonic, an initial tonic that is followed by a chord that is member of the subdominant family, in this case, the actual subdominant. And the next two chords, we can really, we can really conceive as just one chord, as the five chord with two suspensions. We could consider that this is a G major chord with a four, three suspension, the C going to B, and with a six, five suspension, the E going to D. And so that is a member of the dominant family. And finally, we have a final tonic, that is the moment of repose, the point of cadence. When a cadential progression is made of the fundamental harmonic functions in this particular order, we can call it a complete cadential progression. When it lacks one or more of these chords, as long as the two final chords are five to one, we can still call it a perfect authentic cadence, but in that case, we just call it an incomplete cadential progression. Consider the following quote, surviving is important, thriving is elegant. We can see that there's two punctuation marks in there. There's a comma and there's a period or a full stop at the end. Even though both of these punctuation marks create a sense of repose or a little rest, we can say that the comma in the middle does not have the same amount of closure as the full stop at the end, right? So music is just exactly like that. Not every cadence has the same degree of closure. And I think this is a good thing, and either for music or language. If Every time that you had a little pause, it was a full stop. It would go against the flow of the speech or the music that you're trying to say. It'd be like a car, just like moving 10 meters and stopping and then moving 10 more and stopping again and moving 10 more and stopping. And that is not the kind of music that we like to listen to. 
Just like speech and just like language, music also has moments of varying degrees of closure. The closer than a moment of music follows these schemas or these patterns that composers use to indicate finality, the more degree of closure we perceive. We can classify different types of cadences by their degree of closure. So for example, this first one, it is still an authentic cadence because the last two chords are a five and a one. However, if you look closer, the five is on its first inversion and the melody ends on the third degree on an E. So we still call this an authentic cadence, but this is an imperfect authentic cadence. It deviates a little bit from those patterns, from those norms that we expect. You've already heard plenty of authentic cadences today, so I'm not gonna play anymore. Let's go to the next one. When the progression of chords lifts out the dominant chord and it goes from the subdominant to the tonic, we call this a plagal cadence. A lot of people call this the amen cadence because it usually happens after a perfect authentic cadence has been reached at the end of a piece and it just goes. So it's a different kind of sense. Let me, let me play for you a couple of examples. We can call it the Alleluia cadence this time. Another example was Radiohead's High and Dry, which was the first excerpt that I played. As you move farther away from that specific pattern, you start perceiving less and less closure. For example, this one doesn't have the final tonic, it just finishes on the dominant. We call that a half cadence, and it is a point of repose, but it's very open. When a segment of music finishes on the dominant and it doesn't actually resolve to tonic, it doesn't provide that complete sense of, of closure. However, it does bring a little pause. It could be like a, a question mark or something like that. It leaves it very open. So we call this a half cadence. It's like, no, you're, you're not a real cadence. You're just half of it. Uh, let me play a couple of examples. This one is Una Aura Amorosa by Mozart and is part of Cosi Fan Tutte. You can definitely sense a pause there, but it doesn't have that much closure. It's pretty open. Another example that I like is this. So if by the time the bar closes and you feel like falling down, I'll carry you home. Last semester when I played this and I stopped it right there, somebody said, why would you stop it like that? We needed to, go. It just, it was about to continue. That is exactly the kind of feeling that a half cadence would incite in you because you feel some pause, but it needs to go somewhere else. It's not complete, re it's not complete relaxation because we haven't reached tonic yet. The last type of cadence and the one that has the less amount of closure happens when the tonic chord at the end gets replaced by a submedian, by the sixth chord. This shatters our expectations of closure so much that we say that it deceives us. We call it a deceptive cadence. In Spanish, for example, we call it a broken cadence because it breaks it, it doesn't, doesn't let it finish. So let me play an example. This is impromptu number two in F sharp, opus 36 by Chopin. If we were to put all these different kinds of cadences and we organize them from less closure to most closure, we have something, we would end up with something like this. The perfect authentic cadence creates the most amount of closure, then goes the imperfect authentic cadence, then the plagal cadence, then the half cadence, which is very open, and then the deceptive cadence would be the one with the least amount of closure. So good, we've all made it to the end of the video. So to sum up, let's say that in this video, we talked about phrases and cadences, and we defined a phrase as a segment of music that expresses a complete musical thought that has a distinct beginning, middle, and end, and that completes directed motion towards a cadence. And then we defined a cadence. We started with Mr. Cox's definition that a cadence is a resting point of the spirit that only feeling can determine. Then we got a little less poetic and more technical, and we define the cadence as the completion of a melodic and harmonic progression that serves to articulate the end of a phrase. 
This is all for this video, and I will see you guys in class. Bye-bye.